students, the students of journalism from the Ian uh, School of Mass Communication. And uh, I've been told by Ayush that uh, you'd like to attend our sessions regularly. You are most welcome. All right. Um, yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, so the Foreign Correspondents Club was uh, established in 1958. This is our 60th uh, uh, anniversary. The Vice President of India inaugurated the anniversary celebrations in April this year. And we will continue to continue with our celebrations till uh, March next year. <coughs> if uh, any of you wish to join the club, you are most welcome. And uh, the um, friends from the Kerala Press Club, they are most welcome to come and use our facilities. And since they are already members of the Kerala Press Club, it's not necessary for them to join the FCC, but you can still come and uh, carry your ID cards whenever you come to the club. And uh, so you can use our facilities. We keep uh, organizing events here on a regular basis. And uh, you can um, check what is going on by going to our website. The address is there at the back. And um, we, uh, <coughs> whenever we do something, it, as I said, all the members are informed by email and uh, WhatsApp. We have our own Twitter account and Facebook account. You know, we are pretty clued in all the social media because that is the most happening thing. <coughs> So, uh, students of journalism also, I mean, you are the future of Indian journalism, so we are delighted to have you here. So, please feel free and uh, every Saturday we show some great classics uh, movies. Uh, we showed Bicycle Thieves and uh, we showed uh, um, one of Satyajit's great classics and uh, Victor Banerjee was here to inaugurate that by launching the screening of the answer, you know, based on a great yoga guru who lived in the United States, but was of Indian origin. <coughs> so we can um, start now. At the very outset, I want to thank uh, Murali for um, taking time off to come and, uh, uh, you know, talk to us on this uh, issue, how uh, you know, secure is uh, Delhi from natural disasters and have we made enough arrangements to reduce the risk? It seems to me that uh, India, which is not just a country but a subcontinent, as Shakespeare said, uh, troubles come like battalions. You know, we always have, we have either a tsunami, a few weeks ago we had the wo century's worst floods in Kerala, Murli was there and right now as I am talking to you, Tithli is playing havoc along the Kerala and Andhra coast. Uh, so, yeah, Odisha, Odisha sorry, o Odia and uh, Andhra coast. So, this is a very timely kind of uh, talk by uh, Murali. I don't really need to. Is very yes, yes, uh, you know, because uh, they keep having these troubles all the time. So, you know, you gain a bit of experience. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Murali Tumarukudi is a disaster management expert associated with the United Nations. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He is an alumnus of the International Leadership Academy, which is a part of the United Nations University, and a Bihar's fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, one of the most prestigious uh, universities in the world. He has over 25 years of experience in environment and disaster management around the world. Since 2003, Murali has been with the United Nations Environment Program as operations manager for the post-conflict and disaster management branch. He coordinated projects ranging from assessment to capacity building and cleanup in all over the world. He has done studies on disaster preparedness of Indian cities, especially focusing on Delhi and its vulnerability. We are all ears, uh, Murali. Please go ahead. The stage is yours now. Thanks.
Yes. Thank you, uh, Mingit, for the kind introduction, and uh, welcome, Basant. Um, it's a great honor to be invited to the Foreign Correspondents Club, 60-year-old club. It's actually my uh, first time to be given this honor. So um, I must say I'm very, very thankful to the uh, Foreign Correspondents Club for inviting me here, and also the Kerala Press um, Group who co-sponsored this event. And I'm very delighted that um, we have a number of students who have joined in this event so that um, we can have a very fruitful discussion. I'm always excited when I see young people because uh, they, as you mentioned, they are the future of the journalism and the more they know, the better our people will be informed. I have uh, my friend Sunil here who would, if you have your card or if you give your email address to Mr. Sunil, we will send you the presentation material as well as we'll keep in touch uh, with you. As uh, was mentioned, oops. <laughs> I was. This is probably, <laughs> this is probably. It's not a disaster by any <laughs> So this is uh, probably a good way to start, actually. <laughs> Because I, every time I, I'm invited to speak somewhere um, or present, people want to know how the system is prepared, how the world is prepared, how India is prepared, how Delhi is prepared, how Kerala is prepared to deal with disaster. This is what people want to know. People often don't think how they are prepared to deal with it should something happen. I'll give you one example. I was with about 300 of world's top earthquake scientists. And they all came to Iran in a town called Isfahan for this uh, earthquake engineers meeting. And this, was, this meeting was held in a very old hotel. They claim this is the oldest hotel in the world. This is apparently an old camel caravan going through the desert. And this was the water hole of the caravan. And someone built some sort of structure, and then it was expanded, expanded, and it's still continuing. So apparently it's the most long-lasting single, you know, resting place, restaurant, hotel, etc. So therefore they claim it's the oldest one, and the structures are very old. So the function was held in that particular hall in the basement, spectacular place. Now is that a good idea? Probably not a very good idea. That is, Wuhan is a town where, which ha actually had a lot of big earthquake itself. So for the world's best earthquake engineers, or to go and sit in that building for the next three days is probably not a very wise idea. That to, eh? that, to that to basement, not a good idea. Now what would make it worse, and this is where I am asking you to do something, if um, it's not already done, is that when you go to a new place, internationally, we actually get a briefing on safety. You know, what exactly would you do if there is a disaster in that place? So this is the first slide which we normally put. But this is not generally done even, you know, when we do meetings, historically we don't do it actually. UN often lose people. Uh, in Haiti when we had earthquake, 101 UN staff died. But then it's, it is not really part of our own briefing on our own building as to wh how well prepared we are. So I then made it a standing instruction that whenever we start a meeting, we start with a safety briefing. What will we do if something were to happen to us? So even today's presentation, I have formed in such a way, and that's why I'm very happy that the students are here. As much as I talk about Delhi and you know how, what are the issues in Delhi and how prepared in Delhi, I also talk about journalists. How prepared are they to report on disasters? And this is very important as well, because if you put yourself in the way of danger in reporting disaster, that's not very good. The recent floods in Kerala, actually two journalists lost their lives. They, were, they went to report um, the disaster and their, boats caps, uh, the, their boat capsized and two journalists died. <clears throat> this is clearly something which should not happen. But we often assume that disaster is something which happened to other people and we will be there to save them. This is sort of our body language. Now this is not how it works. Sometimes it happens to us and we should also be very prepared uh, for that. So my presentation actually would have 
a segment of that as to how the media should prepare. And this, I have the generally stud um, student especially in mind. I am assuming that some of the, those people who are journalists may have been trained on some of the things which I will be mentioning. But if you are not actually trained by your organization, I encourage you also to listen to this, but also either get in touch with me as to how do you get yourself prepared better, or you know, look into the internet and other sources. Um, but keeping in mind that look, you know, in, in, while you are preparing with dealing with the disaster, you have a responsibility to yourself and to your family as well. So, so, as I said, I would actually talk not just about Delhi, but also about the role of the media in disasters. And in Delhi, I am actually particularly happy because you are doing this before a disaster. Most places, I, am, I get an invitation after a disaster. Actually, I, I was explaining to my friends the other day, in 2014, I tried to do a seminar like this in Kerala. We had the, the Kerala Press Academy. Now it's called the Media Academy. The uh, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority as well as the Institute of Land and Disaster Management together organizing the event. And everything was paid for, including if people came, their accommodation was paid for. And hardly any journalist turned up, actually. For two, three, because, you know, when there's no disaster, it's not very exciting. When there's a disaster, of course, you know, last, last month I went to do the, exactly the same, same seminar. There were 200 people in the room. But before disaster, like zero. The, the only people who got, whom we got were journalism students you know, who, uh, who came, and then we had a session. So I'm very glad that you are actually thinking about this before. And I'm also t telling you in this context that you should not only report about disaster when the disaster actually happened. You should also periodically write about disasters when it doesn't happen. What are the possibilities of disasters? What is that systems can do? What is that officers can do? What is that individuals can do? Now, this is a very frustrating type of job, and that's my job of my life, actually, that if you talk about this, hardly anybody will listen to you. If you say, you know, there is this type of disaster possible, and this is what you should do, you know, people will just not listen to you. I'll give you one example. For the last 10 years, very often, I write back home in Kerala about two things. As you know, there are a lot of people from Kerala in the Middle East. And dozens of flights land in all the Kerala airports every night. And all the flights land around 2 to 3 p.m., 2 to 3 a.m. So as we, I don't know if any of you have ever landed in Kerala airport in the early morning, land at 3 a.m., and you have, you know, two-month-old kids, and you have 85-year-old grandmothers all standing outside. It's a huge, you know, like you're entering into a, like a mela. And I say, why the two-month-old child and the grandmother has to come to the airport to receive somebody who is probably coming after two years? You know, in two hours, they will be at home, and they can see much more comfortably. Of course, people love their loud ones, and the, the equal number of people to see people off as well. Now, my problem is not that they come. Every year, at least 100 people die on the road on, while they're coming to see you off or receive their loud ones. And these journeys are entirely unacceptable, uh, unnecessary, and therefore those deaths are avoidable. But people still do. I also write that you should not drive at night, after 10 a.m., before 6 a.m., please keep off the road because it's very dangerous. Statistically, as I keep telling, and people actually don't believe it, that, you know, as part of my job, I go to Kabul and Damascus and, um, you know, all, all sort of places which you, if I, am asked, if I ask you to go to Kabul, you would probably say no. If I ask you to go to your parents, even if you say yes, your parents probably would say no way. I'm going to let you go to Kabul. But if, you're, if the same parent, if asked, okay, I've got an assignment in Kerala, they will say, good, you know, go for it. But statistically, you are more in danger in the roads in Kerala or any other Indian state for that matter than in Kabul or Damascus, I can tell you this. And you can verify that statistically looking at how many people live there and how many people die, you know, being picked up by uh, 
No, but, hmm? In, no, it's no congestion. It's just statistically the number of people who die on the roads per year in India is the highest in the world. 168,000 people die on our roads every year. Why for what reason? Just, you know, accidents, one or the other reason. That, I, I could have an entire seminar on that, but uh, um, there are. Can you make the presentation? Yeah. So I mean, we could come back to that. But yes, um, so that's a, um, an issue. So I would actually talk about the, the role of uh, the media. There is media, media is an effective two way link between those who are affected and, um, and the people. And this is a very, very, very important role which, which you play. And it is important that the information about disasters come to the people um, as, soon as, pe as soon as possible so that people can respond to it. So for, in this disaster, for example, there was overwhelming support to people in Kerala from all parts of the country as well as the world, but it came in sequence. So initially, social media went among people from Kerala around the world. So support started coming. Then the national media picked it up, so tremendous amount of support came from the rest of India. All our train stations were full with people sending stuff into Kerala. And then the international media picked up, and then you know, offers of support started coming from other places. So media plays a very, very important role. But media also has a responsibility of pointing out failures in prepared, preparedness and so on. I want to tell you what is internationally considered a disaster. A disaster is something which a system cannot handle. So if you have an accident, that by itself is not a disaster. If the system can deal with it, then it's not considered a disaster. So if you have a tanker rolling over and the local system is able to deal with it, then it's not a disaster. But if the system is not able to deal with it, then it becomes a disaster. So it's not just about the number of people who die which define a disaster or the amount of property which is damaged. It's about whether the outside system around it can deal with it. And disasters globally are classified into tiers. A tier one disaster is something which can be handled locally. So if something happens in New Delhi and the New Delhi can deal with it, it's called a level one or tier one. In India, it's called a level one or L1 disaster. And a level two disaster is something which gets escalated from the district level to a state level. And level three or tier three is something which is escalated nationally in the India context. So India context, district, state, center, L L1, L2, L3. Internationally, it is more like an international L1 would be something which is handled by a state, L2 would be something handled by the country, and L3 will be something which need global assistance. So the tiers actually change, but the, the methodology, the terminology remain the same, T1, T2, T3, or L1, L2, L3. Both the UN and the state actually use, uh, and, and the country actually use the same, same terminology. Internationally, the disasters are actually on the rise. Now this is for two reasons. One is that more and more people are living in vulnerable areas. I will come back to this point again in Delhi, that why is that Delhi is so vulnerable? So more and more people are living in more vulnerable areas. So that's one reason. The second reason is clearly that of climate change. 80% of the disasters which we see these days is some way linked to climate. So it is either drought or flood or a hurricane or a forest fire some variation of that. And um, as the latest report on climate change says, it is not getting any better. It's actually, if at all anything, it's actually getting worse and it's, it could be much, much worse than this. And in, in the UN, 80% of what we deal with is related to climate change. So um, something which we have to uh, worry about because things are happening in places where it never happened. So cyclones are happening in areas which never happened. And cyclones are ha happening at a, such a intensity that it never happened as well. So they are even considering whether CAT 5 is good enough or whether they should establish a CAT 6 for a higher category or higher speed, high, uh, highly powerful cyclones. I want to tell you a little bit about the international architecture. And again, this is particularly because during all the times of disasters, 
there are confusion about you know international assistance and UN assistance and when can you get assistance, who can get assistance, and so on and so forth. So dis uh, disasters happen very um, regularly around the world, and UN, in, in fact, re responds to many disasters, and the re responses are always based upon a request from the member state. So a member state make a request, and the assistance happen, and it is calibrated to the needs of the local, the country which is making the request. So con some country may need help in terms of goods and goods, you know, cloth, food, etc. Others may just need a specific technical ex expertise, such as an oil spill or a explosive dismantling, and some may need help with coordination. So depending upon whatever it is, we uh, provide that assistance. We have, internationally, we have something called a UN Disaster Assessment and Coordination Mechanism, where if a disaster request come, the UN has a capacity to respond to within few hours, and then a team is deployed. For example, in Indonesia right now, there are UN teams on the ground to deal with the the tsunami type of uh, episode. And then based upon that assessment, a international call out is made for assistance and that's then responded to by other donors and agencies. <coughs> After disasters, the UN and World Bank often jointly conducts what we call a needs assessment. That's a cost estimate of the damage. And that is often then used by the country to raise funding internationally. So the UN after the Nepal earthquake, for example, the UN and the World Bank jointly did a needs assessment and came with a estimate, I remember, I think it was $4.5 billion, and that's then used by the country to raise funding for that. We also do what, what we call cluster coordination. After a disaster, hundreds of organizations land up in the country. So, for example, there could be 20 organizations who are dealing with children arriving in a country. In, in Indonesia right now, probably there are 20 organizations dealing only with food. So how do, you, how do you coordinate those organizations? How do you tell which people to go where, et cetera? That's also another function which UN often does. Within India, we have our own very robust system of disaster management. So, and this happened after the 2004 tsunami. And this is, you know, unfortunately, this is how laws happen. Uh, something very severe happens, and suddenly there's a uh, legislative urgency. And this happened, if you look at the Indonesian, uh, Indian Ocean uh, surroundings, all countries which are hit by tsunami, within one or two years, they all had a new law. Others who were not you know, hit, they still don't have the law. So Indonesia have a law, Thailand has a law, um, Maldives has a law, Sri Lanka has a law. Uh, on disaster management, and as per our law, um, it established the National Disaster Disaster Management Authority, National Institute of Disaster Management, National Disaster Response Force, National Disaster Response Fund, and so on. And of which the National Disaster Response Force is considered a international best practice. This is a. Uh, somebody has to connect the power. Is that power switched off there? Is just ensure that you don't explode again. If you could just move away from there and just check if it's not, you know, if probably you could just move from there. <laughs> okay, okay. So So, uh, so India has a um, very robust disaster management um, system. And then following that law, we also have a similar system in Delhi. So we have a Delhi Disaster Management Authority where the Lieutenant Governor is at the apex, below which is the Chief Minister and uh, composed of many members. So we do have a, a, a robust system in, in Delhi. And even though Delhi has not been tested as much as Orissa, um, in terms of flooding, at least, you know, Delhi has a lot of experience, unfortunately. Almost uh, every alternate year, there is some degree of flooding one, one, one place or other but in Delhi. Now, our, 
all hypotheses in the United Nations as well as in the World Bank is that there are no national, natural disasters. What we have are natural phenomena such as cyclones, such as heavy rain, such as fire. But what makes it a disaster is when we do our planning, urban, rural, infrastructure, housing, whatever, without due understanding of the natural hazards. So if you have building built right in front on a coastline which can be hit by a tsunami, then the tsunami becomes a potential for a natural disaster. Otherwise, tsunamis come, tsunamis go. It will modify the coastline, but it will not convert this into a disaster. And there's the same hypothesis for almost everything else, be it flood, be it, be it forest fire, for, fire and forest is very natural something which happens. But then when you have invested a lot of your resources there, then you have a natural disaster forming. And in this context is where climate change is coming. Climate change is not bringing a new set of disasters. Most climatic disasters is what is known to human beings. It is just that it acts as a magnifying glass. So if you have a normal type of cyclone coming, a bigger cyclone is coming. A normal rain is coming, a bigger rain is coming. What we clearly know in climate change is that the rainfall intensity is increasing. So even in, even in places where the total amount of rainfall is increased, uh, not increasing, and in places where it's even decreasing sometime, the rainfall intensity is increasing. So more rainfall in shorter time, which means that you have the chance of having a flood, but also a drought, because then the number of ra non-rainy days is on the rise. So you have a problem on both ends. Something which, again, Delhi um, has to think of and deal with, and I will come to that shortly. And though natural hazards are very, very different, they have some characteristics which is very predictable. We often say disasters cannot be predicted with high intensity. Earthquake in particular, we assume that earthquakes, you know, you never know when it will come, etc., is our standing assumption. And this is actually not very true. Earthquakes are, in a way, one of the most predictable um, natural hazards. And this is something, again, in context of Delhi, um, those of you who are uh, young and who are inquisitive should do some work on this. Because earthquakes come out of natural forces which are physical and, uh, for example, if, say, there is a fault getting compressed, periodically it releases the tension and it becomes an earthquake. And then it go back to the original condition and then start to build up the pressure and then it releases again. So it's actually almost at very periodic intervals that these disasters come back. And we almost know these are going to come back. For example, we always knew that there will be an earthquake in Nepal. We almost, we know now that there will be an earthquake in San Francisco, for example, because it has happened, it will happen again. And we, people in Japan know how periodically um, earthquake come and I'll show you one example as to how they actually predict uh, tsunamis and something which you know, we can also think of doing in Delhi. So that's earthquake. It, it's very predictable. It kills a lot of people in very short time. The earthquake in Haiti, 200,000 people, 36 seconds. So that's what it took, 36 seconds, so less than one minute. And after earthquake, you're either dead or alive. If you're alive, you're alive. If you're dead, you're dead. So it was like that. Whereas the flooding is slightly different. So flooding, you may hear terminologies like a 100-year flood. So a 100-year flood doesn't mean every 100 years there'll be a flood of the same magnitude. It just shows that a flood of very high magnitude have one in 100 chance of happening every year. So you can actually have two 100-year floods in consecutive years. Or you may not have a 100-year flood in 200 years. But statistically, you have one in 100-year. Earthquake is not like that. There will be, the earthquake will not come one after the other in the same place because the pressure has to build up. Whereas rainfall can happen similar. Actually, in, if you look at Delhi, in 76 and 78, they had very high intensity flood. I think one, one in 50-year flood um, in 76 and 78. And so if you, the very fact in Kerala, many people are now asking, um, 
you know, we had this heavy rain and flood and therefore will there be a drought now? I said, there is no theory like that. You could actually have a flood again. So the one flood doesn't eliminate the chance of other flood, whereas one earthquake actually eliminates the chance for quite some time. So there is a distinct difference. In flooding, normally you get a lot of time uh, warning, other than in flash floods um, or a dam opening or something like that, you get the, the buildup of flooding is very, very gradual. So therefore you do get some time to save yourself. And that's why the number of people who die in floods are actually very low unless there's a breach of a dam or a dike or, a ta you know, which is coming after a hurricane. But um, it l damages lots and lots of property because um, the water go in and they stay for very extended time. And most of the time, you cannot recover anything. In an earthquake, you know, the, most of the stuff inside the house you could recover, but whereas after the flood, most of the stuff inside the house, including your automobiles, almost always gone. In, in Kerala this time, I don't know, tens of thousands of vehicles are 100% right off because water entered and it was there for days together. So the, in terms of loss of, total loss of flooding is a lot more damaging than an earthquake. I want to show you some example, and I'm, I'm, I'm building it up to Delhi so that, you know, here my objective today is not to tell you this is what is going to be Delhi and this is what you should be taking here, but I'm, you know, going to make you curious so that you can, you'll go back and do some digging and find out how, you know, where Delhi is and where the risks are lying. I, I'll give you the pointers. Then you can dig up and find out how soon it's going to come and what you can do about it. So this is in Japan. They have a temple called a tsunami temple. Now, one issue with the disasters globally is that we don't have a social memory of disasters. When a disaster comes, we don't keep that in mind. Even the worst possible disasters we keep in mind for about 20 to 30 years. After that, we forget. Whereas, I mean, if it's a war or something, then we keep it for generations. But when it comes to disasters, very short. So if people are asked, when was the last cyclone in Orissa, for example, there are two. I think there was one in 2014, which did not kill a lot of people, but there was one in 1999, which killed close to 100,000 people. But most people will not remember this. Actually, yesterday myself had a confusion whether it was 97 or 99. Actually, I checked last night. So, hmm? it'll come. So, so in Japan they have a system because, and tsunamis don't come once in every generation. Tsunamis sometimes come 200 years, sometimes come 500 years. Um, for example, Kerala, um, India, we had a tsunami in 2004. But before that, we can't even remember, nobody remember India having a tsunami before that. So did it happen 1,000 years back? We don't know. So Japan had a, a tradition by which when they had a, tsunami, they will put a rock at a point and say this is where a tsunami came, whenever it came. So it's called a tsunami rock. It's a warning to the future generation that don't build, build between that point and the sea because a tsunami can come again. So this is a warning which uh, one generation is giving to another generation. So they built this temple and this was about five kilometers from the beach. and. When they lived with that temple for long enough, people actually assumed that this is just a temple and this has nothing to do with history. So they acted, then used this as a more like a shrine where you know they went and prayed and everything. But they started building between that point and and the sea. So this was um, the Japanese coastline and the. And the tsunami temple is something which you cannot see in this picture. There's much behind it. So we had a Japanese professor who actually went and did a research of taking a, a soil core inside and check whether tsunamis had happened there. And the experiment was very simple. So he took a soil core, and whenever he saw 
a sand layer there. He assumed that the sea sand would have come to that point. And he had multiple such, such layers. And then he did a carbon dating, and he found that 1,100 years had, is the typical interval between two sand layers. So if it 1,100, 1,100, 1,100. So the last one had happened in, in 863 AD, in which they had history. So therefore, he assumed that in a big tsunami is now due. And he then wrote this in 2011 and said, look, a big tsunami was due. But of course, people did not take that very seriously. And this is the chance for Delhi. And that's why I'm telling this now. So you look at history, you look at the past and say, if something had happened, look, statistically, there's a chance that it will come back. So people still did not believe it. And they built where they should not have built. And then the tsunami came. And then you can see there are no houses left in that place. And this is how nature work because nature has such a tremendous memory that you know regardless of what you do the nature will always come back cause the same similar disaster and it doesn't matter whether you know a place has become a, remained a village it has become a capital city very important people live there a lot of money is invested or not nature don't care of any of these things so something is you have to be worried about so I'll give you just one more example before I'll go to Delhi. So in 2011, I actually went to Thailand where they had a flooding. And um, I think 23 out of the 27 uh, provinces um, were fully flooded. And uh, flooding was very massive. So you have the uh, farmlands, the airport, they were all flooded. And they, this was a Nissan car factory which was completely flooded. Tens of thousands, uh, thousands of cars, actually 10,000 cars were flooded. Actually, they had big industrial area, which was completely uh, flooded. Uh, and then this was, um, you know, yeah. It's actually yeah, a elevated highway, which had become a temporary car park. Because that is the only way they could save the car. And then, now this picture, I took all in 2011. And when I used to show in Kerala, People used to laugh at it. You know. But now, everyone in Kerala can relate to this because we saw it all. We saw it, the airport flooded, we saw the temple flooding, we saw things like this. We had the biggest flyover actually, even flooding on the flyover. And we had cars washed away, and we had people going around and playing, and you, you must have seen all these images from Kerala as well. This is Japan? No, do you know, this is Thailand actually. Thailand, Thailand in 2011. So in 2011, I came back. And then I asked my mom, and uh, my mom always used to say about a big flood in nine, you know, we call that the flood of 99, which is the Malayalam era. So it's 1924, there was a great flood in Kerala. And um, everyone talk about it. We have some people who have written stories about it. Um, there is a, a set of poetic literature in the north of Kerala about this flood of 99. But not many people actually remember to mark it anywhere. So everyone knew about a flood, but nobody knew where the flood um, went. But one temple, somebody had thought about it, and he or she put a mark there, saying the flood of 99 came here. So they, they put a mark all around that um, temple. And this place, we went. Myself and Sunil went. And this was near no water body. There's no water body anywhere. There's no river. There's nothing. And you, know, you standing there, you would never imagine, oh, no, no, this is like, grandmother's trying to freak you out, um, is what you would imagine. So we went, and you can see this. This is a temple. All around it, there is nothing, no water around to come. But then, because the water would keep level, we where did. Is this? Where is Kerala? It's Parur. North Parur. North Parur, yeah. Pudikav. Yeah, Pudikav temple. Uh, uh, three or four places like this. mark. So based upon those inside, you know, I, this map was actually made in 2013 for a seminar in Kerala. So I drew a map and say where the water will go. And I, the, the term, you, you can see a sort of runway there. So this is the Cochin Airport runway. So I, I had made this thing in 2013 and showed, look, you know, this is going to be flooding at some point if the original flood come back, which it, or always it will come back. And then, of course, it came. And then satellite image? These yeah. are satellite images, superimposed with the information which we had. 
And then this is the industrial area, which I, again, I, you know, this was not there in 1924. You know, this is where we had the, you know, the pesticide factories and the chemical factories and everything was there. So I said, look, you know, when the water comes, this will run over all these places and you will be in a little bit of a mess. And uh, the water came, of course. And surprisingly, it came, you know, it was only one, it, it was actually one feet below the previous one. Okay, so it was not as bad as the previous one. But ex people have become a lot more. Yeah, this is actually 1099 our Malayalam era, not the English, uh, not the, uh, we, we have a different calendar. 1924. Four, yeah. So, but of course, between then and now, Kerala had become a lot more. Since 1924, flood was more intense. That's correct. That's correct. So, but there are a lot more people living in Kerala and a lot more people living on the river banks of Kerala because the, the rivers are all dammed up. So, there are no people who had a sense of false security that look, nothing is going to happen below and then they all built and the Riverside became the most expensive real estate uh, in the state and um, people also became a lot more richer. So now, as I was explaining in 1924, hardly anybody had a motor car. So you know, no cars were damaged. This flood, tens of thousands of cars. Nobody would have had a, a laptop or you know, washing machine or anything of that sort. So tremendous, tremendous damage this time. You know, many billions of dollars were damaged. And this way, it was entirely predictable and preventable. And this is the point of departure. So the point I'm making is that in any city, any country, any state, most disasters are very predictable and therefore preventable. But you have to think much ahead. If I, most people think that the city will be safe. If I told you, you know, Delhi will have an earthquake tomorrow, you think, oh, this is very good. This is what disaster risk collection is all about. No, this is not. This will help you to save lives. People can leave the house. This is why super cyclone don't cause as much death. People can move out. But the same number of buildings will collapse. You know, if you move out or you're in, same number of, and that's not disastrous collection in itself. That just saves lives. How do you prevent that disaster? You cannot prevent an earthquake from happening. It will always happen. But if you want to minimize it, you have to invest in the building codes and we have to build, invest in land use planning and many other things which I'll come to. And we have the time now to do that in Delhi or many other places. So like every other city, Delhi have their own disaster risk. And you know, I will not talk about the security part, but this, uh, this I took from uh, Delhi's, um, Delhi has a plan and I, I took it directly from their hazard and vulnerability assessment. But uh, earthquake, is considered a very high, uh, considered a high disaster risk. Road accident, high considered. Industrial and chemical accident, high. Floods, moderate, moderate to high um, in terms of vulnerability. Epidemics, um, fires, wind, etc., is considered low. So there are some vulnerabilities for Delhi. I will just pick up four of them. And then I will in introduce a new one, which um, is increasingly uh, going to happen in Delhi. So earthquakes, floods, industrial and chemical accidents, and road accidents, so four of them. So Delhi clearly has an earthquake risk. It has happened in Delhi many times before. And those who are journalistic student here actually should do some research on this and find out what is the return period of this type of um, disasters? There is a 100 year return um, earthquake coming, and there's a 290 year return earthquake coming. One is coming from the Himalayas, and one is coming from the plains. So there are at least two major Himalayan region and Delhi region earthquake possibilities, which is affecting Delhi, and they have different return periods. And this could have an earthquake in Delhi, and they are predicting that it could be you know, five to six and six, six to seven and even seven plus uh, is possible in Delhi. The chances will of course come down, but um, an earthquake which, which could have serious damage is very, very possible in Delhi. Uh, and then depending upon 
the nature of the building, the nature of the construction, and the nature of the soil on which it is constructed, the impact would vary. But clearly, this is some issue which Delhi has to deal with and address. And Delhi is very vulnerable to this because Delhi is a two issues. One is that Delhi has a set of very old history and hi buildings, old buildings, a continuation of buildings from, I don't know, from the time the Mughals decided to move to Delhi type of that type of buildings are there, very much remnants of that, the extension of that, continuation of that. So you have all those possibilities on one side. But I was also looking and seeing the growth of Delhi since the time the British decided to move the modern capital of India to Delhi in 1911. So it had less than 5 lakh people in 1911 and which has now grown to, you know, the 28 plus million. Yeah. So, you know, you have all sort of numbers coming out, um, but tremendous, tremendous number. I don't know if there is any world capital which has grown like that in comparable time. For example, Paris. Uh, and London, they all already had these million people in you know 17th century. So, and the population has not exploded. Whereas in Delhi, tremendous explosion. And when you have that type of people coming in, the place where they will settle become less and less, and they will end up settling in more and more vulnerable areas. And if you drive around Delhi, you will actually see the you know the nature of construction, the quality of construction, etc. So it also not just the population, but also the nature of buildings also creates additional vulnerabilities in Delhi. So clearly, earthquake is something which Delhi should worry about. And then, wanted to show you one example of a historic building which collapsed in Haiti after the, uh, during the 2011 um, earthquake. So they had a, a presidential palace and it's completely collapsed and it has to be demolished like this. Not that it had to be repaired, it's Haiti. Haiti. Yeah. Haiti, yeah. yeah. That was the last earthquake. Last earthquake. Not the current one. No, the, 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 that's one. Not the, not the one last week, no. It's the 2010. 2010 earthquake, yeah, yeah. Even the current one was severe in terms of the rich, richer scale, but the other one was in the capital city. This one is a bit north. And the, you know, I went and stood there and saw this, you know, massive presidential palace, you know, down. Luckily, the president was out of town that day. So he was saved, but many people actually um, died um, in the president's office. They died. And I looked at the, you know, when was this building built? It was built in the 1940s. At that time, of course, the understanding of the world about earthquake, etc., was much less. And the, na the nature of construction was, of course, much less. And many times, as you know, the presidential palaces are all built for their majesty and, you know, and grandioseness rather than um, their f functionality and uh, security is, of course, absolutely well taken care. But when it comes to safety, they, they don't do it as much. Then I, you know, came back and looked at our own, you know, Rashtrapati Pavan, when was it built? And it's actually built even before. And, uh, you know, what is our understanding of earthquake at that time, etc. So, Things you know we should also consider. You know they should actually be looking at those things. You know, so it's not something which I have an a priori opinion about. But I'm just saying that if you have an earthquake, all the historic building also is something which you should consider. And uh, uh, it, I don't know about the specific history of each of the building and whether that has gone through an earthquake cycle because, in, in many cases, that's the way to to verify if it has actually, you know, been time tested. But also it's not, that doesn't by, by itself doesn't prove because many of the historic structures which collapsed in Nepal in the last earthquake did survive the previous ones. So just the fact that it survived a previous one by itself don't give you an assurance that it will survive the new one. But certainly an indication that um, you should be worried about. And and the next one is the flooding in Delhi. And I think this is something which you already know because flooding in Delhi is very regular. Some part of Delhi is getting flooded almost every year and some part is getting flooded every, you know, once in two years and major floods happen once in 10 years. And, and the reason here is, is twofold. Um, number one, most of Yamuna has been 
dammed up in the in the top upper reaches. So mo most of the time, riv the river is not flowing. It's normal course even. So more and more land around it appear dry. That this is not the part of the river. And so people start to construct it, both the government as well as private. And then occasionally, heavy rains come, and the, the water level breaches, and then you have flooding events happening. And in this context of climate change, one has to imagine that you'll have slightly bigger such events. So therefore, more and more uh, areas getting flooded. And of course, hmm? Okay. Now, I have not studied Gurgaon specifically. Maybe we could do discuss in the end as to why this is happening, and there may be other people in the room who may be able to answer this question. Flooding can happen either coming from the river outwards, or it can happen the opposite way. That water is supposed to be reaching the river, but that's also getting blocked by the new construction. For example, you build a new road along where the water should be draining, and that then become a flood hazard behind the road. And this is very typical in many places. Yeah, we have, um, yeah, we have a, a damage was never opened, and that, that became a flood risk in itself. So, so another disaster which um, Delhi is very vulnerable is, uh, is flooding. And um, I think the biggest flooding in the recent times, I think, happened was 1978. Uh, was the, uh, the but even, the, even after that, a lot has been built, you know, in terms of the both private and the public, uh, tremendous amount of population growth as well. So a lot more vulnerable. Delhi is a lot more vulnerable now than before. As I said, the population grew. Uh, the number, the figure I got was 19 million. I don't know. You know I get all sort of numbers of what's the population of Delhi, but the, the estimate right now yeah, is 28.5 20, million, and and more and more um, people coming in, and poor people, the migrants, they always end up in more and more marginal places, and they are the most affected. And I think there are places in in Delhi we, whose houses get flooded every year, and they move out and they come back to the same place. You have a trans area, area. Yeah, it, uh, it always happens. And this is one disaster which is newly getting introduced all over India, the high-rise building fire. Um, many of our places, we are, even in Kerala, we are now, you know, more and more high-rise building. And this flood, what it does to people's psyche is that they think living in a high-rise apartment is a good idea. Now, when you have an earthquake, people start to think the opposite. So when I went to Nepal, people who are actually Living in the apartment, they all wanted to come down and live somewhere. And I will never live in an apartment. Now, when I go home, people are saying, no, 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 I will never live in you know, this thing. I want to go up. And um, so it's one at a time. But uh, apartment fire, I think there was one recently. This picture, I think, is from Gurga, where a young lady died um, due to apartment. But that's, even in, Delhi, even in London, where a tremendous number of regulations and a fire service since, since 1600, they had this, you know, Grenfell Towers, which killed 70 people, and they're still, you know, debating. And people have, you know, let's say, wrong notion about the firefighting capacities. Um, people assume that if helicopters will be able to come and rescue you and so on. And the Grenfell Tower experience is that it caused two things. Number one is that people assumed, so they saw helicopters going around, so people assumed that it will save them. Um, so they went up instead of going down, even, if, even when they had time. And then, uh, of course, when if a helicopter ever try to come near a fire, then of course it increases the risk to the helicopter as well as the fire. So, so don't count on the on the helicopter. So, if a new apartment block is actually telling you that we have a helicopter and a system, then you know, really, you know that they are just trying to sell something to you, which which it's not. But again, the key is that you, as a resident of the apartment, should be prepared about this. Most of the time we assume that disaster is something which happens in Dubai or Hong Kong or London or, or Gurgaon, but not in your apartment. You know, your apartment is, of course, very safe. So in my apartment where I stay in Kochi, I offered to give a lecture, and um, there are 102 apartments uh, in that block, and there are only 50 of them are occupied. Still, there are 300 residents, and I went one evening like this, and there are nine residents who are listening to me. And uh, 
six of them were the committee members and rest were my family members. <laughs> and uh, and that's, uh, that's as much interest. Honestly, there is, you know, when we talk about disasters, there is really no interest. And that's why I'm so pleased that, you know, this room at least have a respectable number of people, you know, whom I can talk to. I frequently write about drowning. The number of people who drown in India is, you know, unbelievable. More than 28,000 people, I think, die drowning every year. In Kerala alone, more than 1,300 people die drowning every year. So we go around, myself, Sunil, and few others, go around telling people drowning death, big issue, drowning death, big issue. So we go to one beach in Kerala to teach them about drowning death. So we arrange everything, and the local police chief is there. I'm speaking, and, and there are 10,000 people on the beach. Like, no one is coming to listen to us, you know. Like, we are like, and the chief of police came and said, yeah, sir, it's very good, very good. You carry on, and he went. <laughs> and uh, so I started speaking, and completely by accident, exactly at that time, someone started to drown. Uh, we didn't set it up, but it happened. And luckily, because we had some kit with us, you know, our team was able to help in the rescue operation. And instantly, there were 10,000 people listening to me. Now, you know, you cannot have that type of situation where you have to wait for a disaster before people will listen. So if you are living in an apartment, the first thing to do is to go and check out if your fire service exit is actually open. Most of the time, it is not open. Check out if the people in the, secu in the building actually know how many people are disabled in that building. So, you know, you all know, of course, in case of fire, don't use the elevator. Of course, if, what, what will you do if there is a disabled person in your house on the 16th floor? But if you have a you know, grandfather or grandmother, you know, do you save yourself? You know, do you run if they're alone? How will you know? you know? How do you keep track of this? And we have actually no system in most places. In Kerala, at least, it's not there. I don't know if in Delhi it's any different. In Western world, you are supposed to mandatory to do an exercise of evacuation drill at least once a year. So once a year, everyone had to evacuate. They, they will time it, how long it will take. Then they will know if there are some people who were you know, not mobile or no, who did not know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so I hope those of you who are in this building, who are living in an apartment block, will today at least go and check, or at least this weekend you will go and check if you can escape in terms of, of an incident, and at least try to walk down the stair. And, and we do it all the time. When we, when I go and stay in a, in a hotel, for example, as per by my training. If I go to a place to, to stay in a hotel, I'm not allowed to take a room below the second floor, above the sixth floor. So it always has to be between the second and the sixth floor. That's all, we always stay. Is this uh, is mandatory like for UN floor? It's mandatory. Why is it like that? The reason is that um, up to the second floor, there's higher possibility of break-ins. You know, people could you know, enter throughout there. Also, if you have a, in many cases where I go, there is a possibility of a, let's say, a terrorist attack or a bomb in the road, etc. So the chance that it will come, um, impact your room is higher up to the second floor. So, the, so up to the second floor is a little bit vulnerable. Above the seventh floor, you know, you have to walk down in case of a fire. And if you are staying in the 60th floor or something, then it's actually a lot more, you know, tricky to walk down. Uh, you know, if you go to Japan or something, Thailand, you always have this, you know, 67 floor hotel, and it's very, very tempting to stay in a very uh, top floor. But we are always told that between second and seventh floor, and as so for what it, do you mean we? The UN, the UN employees, UN employees, UN employees. But you know, this instruction can be used by you as well. You know, most of the time you know you don't think about consciously. You will just okay, whatever room comes. But when you go to a hotel, you can always ask, and I want to stay you know, between second and sixth floor. And then, then you just go down and check if the security, uh, the safety door is open. And I can assure you that nine out of 10 times will be old bed stuffed uh, on the exit, always. And then you tell them that, look, you know, this is not a good idea. And then, you know, what is, and I, and I often, when I go to a hotel, and especially if you were to conduct a program, we always ask them, what is the assembly area in this place? Okay, when you have an incident inside, we are not allowed to just run away you know, from the building and go home. Because what happens is that, let's say there's a building collapse or a fire. The hotel will know that there are 300 guests in this place. 
once the fire happened, they will call the fire service. The fire service will ask how many were there. They will say 300. So they will count how many people are outside. Okay, 250. So the 50 people must be stacked. So they will start to rescue operation for the 50, even though you are probably, you know, taken an auto rickshaw and gone somewhere. So you should always make yourself known to somebody outside that you are safe. And this is very routine in terms of building collapse and so on. People will just leave, and th that's also not something which you should do. So you should always have an assembly area where after you evacuate, you wait there, you take a head count, you let people know that, look, you are safe, then you can do what you want to do. And uh, so these type of drills should become mandatory. And this is so easy that if you have a resident association who do you know, Diwali and Mela and this and that and the other, you could spend one day or two hours to do a safety drill. And this is how you really make yourself safe. Of course, the system should make yourself safe by having all sort of things, but practically, your own chance can be improved much more if you behave differently. This is a picture of Delhi from the, the various districts and um, you know, what type of hazards they are more vulnerable to, etc. I can, I, I'll share the slides for you. But uh, earthquake all across, floods, many districts, and building collapse is an increasing risk in, in Delhi because Delhi is one of the cities where the apartment blocks came, you know, the earliest time where the standards are not very good. And Delhi has a, a little bit of a unique disaster management system compared to other places. In other places, there's a state chief minister and then everything falls below it. Whereas here, because Delhi is also national capital territory, so the central government get involved, the state government get involved, the uh, lieutenant governor get involved. So there is a little bit of additional complication here in dealing with uh, natural uh, disasters. So there are mu but there are systematic things which are done. But in terms of disaster risk reduction, as I said, it is not really about you know, big immediate term action. It's about really long-term planning. Disaster risk reduction is really about long-term planning, knowing it before. Better land use planning is the number one solution to disaster risk reduction. World over, this is proven that if you plan your land better, you understand what disasters are there, and then it's not that you don't do anything in areas which are vulnerable, you build differently. So Japan built their you know, houses in a very vulnerable area, but they do to a different building standard. You can have buildings in a floodplain, but then you build them differently. You think, uh, for example, you might have, you know, you don't put your generator in the basement in a flood-prone area because then the you know, generator gets flooded. You may have your car park, you know, one floor higher, and that would save 100 cars in the event of a car park. And the basement, you know, the base of the area you might leave for children to play. So there are many, many ways in which land use planning can reduce disaster risk. Of course, having building codes is not enough. You ought to have better implementation of building codes. You can also retrofit buildings. So it is not that just because you have a new building code, you, you know, demolish every building and rebuild it. As I said, San Francisco is expecting a, 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 an earthquake, and they have been preparing for it since 1980. So every house hold has been given what are the few things which they can do to be safer during a disaster. Um, for example, one example would be during the two, 1995 Kobe earthquake, a lot of people died in Japan. I think 5,000 people died in Japan. Now, Japan is very well built for an earthquake. So people are surprised with why so many people died. And they found that during the 1980s, people shifted from individual gas connection at home to a pipe supply all over the city. And the piping were made of GI pipes, which are not flexible. So when the earthquake happened, the gas got released all over the city. And then it caught fire. The buildings were made of wood because of the earthquake. And then a lot of people died. So in the United States, they learned from that. So they said, OK, the connection of the ga gas pipe has to be flexible so that it can deal with an earthquake. So like that, there are many things you can do, even in an ex existing city. And that's the type of thing which in Delhi also we should have. And I think there are many, go many things going on, but not necessarily to every facility. And then, then there is something about critical infrastructure protection. If you have your hospital and your police station and your telecom center, you know, breaking down the first flooding or earthquake, then your city is much less prepared than if these facilities are 
better managed. During Chennai flood, there were hospitals which were flooded. There, during floods in Kerala, there were hospitals which were flooded. In my own town, the hospital was flooded, the ground floor, and that's where all the medical records were kept. So, you know, pregnant women lost all their records, uh, and you know, the, now they are said, okay, you know, now <laughs> start all over again, uh, you know, all their childhood. Uh, so you could, but these things could have been done differently, that you, know, you can have your records kept somewhere else. You could have different facilities in different floors, and you don't have your generator or oxygen cylinder stored in the most vulnerable areas. So it's all about knowing it in advance and planning it differently. And emergency preparedness has to be at every level. So it's not that, it's not good enough if the government has an emergency preparedness or the district has an emergency preparedness. Does your home have a, an emergency preparedness? What will your family do in case of an emergency? Um, and these are all you know, put to test during our recent floods in Kerala. And there are many lessons like this. I've always said in Kerala before that in Japan, if there's a tsunami, children are told that parents are told that you should save yourself and don't run to the school to save your children. Because if you all run to a school to save your children, all the roads will be blocked in no time. You will save your, you know, you will kill yourself and the children and everybody else. But then the children are told that, that your teachers will look after you so that you don't have to wait for your uh, parents. And then people implement that when something happens like that. So when a flood comes, you should also have that type of protocol in your own home. You know, what will you do if your you know, um, wife has gone to work? You know, what, will, what should she do? Should she go to somewhere else if an alert has come? Should she come home? Et cetera, et cetera. So such a disaster response plan has to be built bottom up. And you should also be able to save yourself and your neighbor. In, in any disaster, be it earthquake, volcano, flood, whatever, 99% of the people are not saved by the system. They're all saved by their family or their neighbors. So the more prepared your neighborhood is, the more safe your city is. And these are all things which you know, people have to start to understand because if you just wait, okay, the government is not prepared, the government is not doing it, this, no, that's not good enough. What is more good is that you are prepared to save yourself and your family and your neighbors. And as I mentioned, protection of disabled migrants and other vulnerable groups, very important. In Kerala this time, we had, uh, we put that to test as well, because all the emergency warning will go out in Malayalam or at best in English. But now Kerala has a huge migrant population of people who speak only Bengali, for example, hundreds of thousands of them. How will they get the information? And uh, big challenge. I want to end by saying few more things, because there are media people here, as to how do you prepare for disasters. If you are in a management role in a media, then I think you should always have people assigned on disaster beat, you know, like education and other. Most, uh, most of the time, this is not there. People only cover disaster when a disaster happens. That's why I said you should also have a continuum of disaster article, even when it's not happening in your town, you talk about you know what can happen and how the city is prepared. Take individual disasters. You can you know talk about you know haze in November and you know flood in July. You know maybe one month before so that people are sensitized to it rather than waiting for the flood and two days before, then it's too late. Also send them to other places when disaster happens so that they get used to that. For example, if Delhi journalists go to Kerala and cover flood, then they get some idea about what a flood could be like so that they can bring the lessons back. Similarly, if a cyclone happens, you go to other towns and learn from it. At individual level, you can also prepare a lot. You can um, prepare at a technical level. You should understand the basics of a disaster. What is a hydroclimatic disaster? What's a geological disaster? What's a moment scale? What's a richer scale? What's vulnerability? What is Sendai framework for disaster reduction? What can, yeah. All these things, you know, you should know. That's correct. So how, how do you, so you should prepare all this yourself um, so that you have basic understanding. But as a good journalist, you should also have a network of contacts to whom you can refer to 
in case you need uh, more information. And when you are deployed in the field, you should also be prepared to deal with the fact that you are in a disaster location. So if you end up in a earthquake place and then you don't have food carried yourself and then you go and ask somebody to provide you food, then you are not doing a service to anybody. So you should be self-sufficient to deal with these things. And I have, you know, if you ask questions, I can tell you more, but I also have, uh, you know, special training only on this. What, what will you carry in your backpack when you go to a disaster place? For example, we are all trained in, in the United Nations to carry only 15 kilos, um, and that should be self-sufficient to survive for three days, plus do your work. Because at least for three days, you should not depend upon the resources which are coming um, to the end. I always tell my journalistic friends that the instinct in most situation for journalists is to find fault. Okay, who was responsible for this flood or earthquake or something on day one, you know, when people are already dying. And this is a very bad idea. That if you actually, even rightly, identify some agency or institution at fault, then globally the willingness of the others to help those people is much less, even though it's not their fault. So let's say this government did not do enough for this. So people will think, okay, it's their fault. So therefore we shouldn't do much. If, you know, if we help this government which didn't do enough to plan, will they do the same if we give them the resources? And what's the end result? The end result is that the individual who is affected will not help get the help which they deserve. So we say all those fault finding can wait. Focus on the individual. What is that they need? What help do they need? Bring them out. Bring human stories. And bring success stories when things are going right. In Kerala, the effort of the youth, tremendous positive story. The support played by Keralaites living outside, tremendous story. The support provided by the rest of India to Kerala, good success story. Bring them out. And then, once the people are all reasonably taken care, then you ask the fundamental question, why didn't we have the right plan? Why didn't we have the resources? Why didn't we have the right land use act? Why the laws were not implemented for building codes? So that's a sequencing event. I always terrify people, my journalistic friends, when I say that they should write a will uh, before they go to journalistic reporting of this. But then I console them saying that I write my will myself uh, because you know, if you live in a country where you have a 11 in 100,000 chance of being hit by a, a car every year or a, or, a, or a road accident, then regardless of whether there will be a natural disaster, it's a very good idea to be prepared for the big eventuality at any, any given point of time. Yesterday I was told about, um, you know, the, this one of the stories which is going is, is a boy who went from Kerala to Chennai to do some work and then he had a sudden hemorrhage or something, hospitalized. And as most people in India, you know, there's no system of health insurance. So if you are stuck in a different part of a state, different state, or even a different country, and if you have a health emergency, you know, you are really, you know, stuck both ways. You are stuck because you are an unknown place and you are stuck with because you have no money. And then of course, look, you know, the Malayalis came together and supported it. But ideally, people should have a proper health insurance. And especially if you are a media house, you are going on a disaster beat to a disaster place. If you don't have a health insurance, then you are not doing a service to yourself or to your media house or to others. I would stop at this point, and then I will take um, questions. And uh, let's see uh, what type of questions you have. Thank you. Yeah. Kindly wait for a microphone to come to you. Identify yourself and ask the question so that uh, everything is recorded and people are watching it in other parts of the country or the world. Right. So this is Han Singh Rajput from ETV. Uh, my question to you is we have the Titli cyclone coming upon us and recently today there was a UN report which stated, which stipulated that in the last 20 years India has lost more than 80 billion uh, dollars worth of money in the natural disasters and it also announced that India is one of the worst hit, one of the worst hit countries and it's in the top five I think. 
uh, which have been marred by natural disasters. So you think in the last 20 years as a country we have learned anything when it comes to this because uh, when we talk about Orissa, it can be said that the natural disasters over there are managed a bit better than the rest of the country. So what do you have to, ta what do you have to say on that? What's your take? The UN report came only two days back, so the, one of your other colleagues also asked me about this, and I have not actually read that specific report, so um, I would read the report, and I do want to, you know, read it very carefully and comment, but the, the generic points which you, are which you are making, the outlines of it, uh, I can comment on it. India is actually globally considered in many ways a big success story on this one, because of our, um, since 2004, we have learned many, many lessons. The uh, National Disaster Management Act, the National Disaster Response Force, which is a set of people trained specifically to deal with the disasters, pre-positioned with specialized equipment in around the world, uh, around the uh, country, which can be deployed, is considered a success story. Our predictive powers mostly have improved very much. As I mentioned, the Orissa super cyclone in 99 killed close to 100,000 people. Whereas by the time the cyclone came in 2014, which in Torisa, the same area, actually the cyclone was slightly stronger. We had better prediction and the number of deaths went below 500 even. So that way it's considered a huge success. But this is a you know, continuing battle. We have to continue to work on this issue. Um, every state which is not hit by disaster also have to learn these um, lessons. Um, Chennai had a disaster, Kerala had one now, but no, we don't have to wait for this disaster to happen before you learn these lessons. So we, the way we are doing it today, that we are looking at things here in the light of what happened in other places. So I think that's our best chance. Yeah. Hi, sir. I'm Ayush from Yan Express. Uh, so in your presentation, you mentioned industrial disasters as well as epidemics, particularly in Delhi. And the, all the districts in Delhi were highlighted for epidemics, particularly. So uh, when it comes to industrial disasters as well as epidemics, as a person living in Delhi, we don't really think of them in, uh, because you think of road accidents, you think of flooding. But epidemics and industrial disasters are really not on our radars and uh, industrial disaster. So in terms of Delhi, could you tell us, are we looking at a Bhopal gas tragedy type of disaster? What is the scale of an industrial disaster in Delhi? And in terms of epidemics, uh, what sort of epidemic? What are we dealing with in terms? I, I picked up this information from the, you, you know, the state's uh, own um, disaster management plan, the, the various uh, vulnerabilities. I haven't gone through the specific details of what epidemics it is uh, happening. The good news about the industrial disasters is that we are talking about small-scale industry. It has actually a list of industries also listed. So it's not a massive thing, because I think that much of land use planning has happened in Delhi that Delhi has no major industries within its uh, domain. We are talking about small-scale industry. The epidemic specifically, I, you know, I, um, I picked it up. It is there in the report. I don't know what specific epidemic is being referred to. But like any major city, you could have you know, some sort of um, epidemics as well. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Kapil and I am from Yanex Picks. First of all, thank you for the very wonderful lecture about the disaster management and the disasters going on. Uh, sir, my question is like, uh, can't we declare the corruption as a man-made disaster? <laughs> Uh, because the reason is that you uh, you just mentioned that uh, being a media student, we should find out the reason behind uh, happening a disaster. What is the reason that that, that particular disaster happened? So, uh, saying particularly about the Delhi, it's uh, seen that town uh, planning commissioner uh, set the guidelines and the rules for uh, planning, the uh, house planning and all these things. But uh, neither the people and nor the police bother about that. So that the earthquake, uh, situations like the earthquake and the flooding ha happens mostly uh, in uh, Delhi. So can't we declare that uh, <laughs> corruption as a man-made disaster? <laughs> yes, you can imagine it's a question beyond my competence to answer, but uh, these are the type of questions young people should ask. Good evening. Uh, should I talk? Good evening, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, I'm Unmukt. I work at Delhi Post, and I'm a law student. And uh, doing internships and stuff, cases do usually come up uh, about Delhi building bylaws. And Delhi building bylaws themselves, they're not concurrent with the new uh, earthquake-resistant 
strategies. And there are routine violations. And the courts have to take a liberal attitude. And there is institutional failure in itself to impose those daily building bylaws. And uh, solving those institution failures is a long-term is a long-term process. If a short-term if a short term, uh, any short term advantage has to be taken, it has to be from an individual scale. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, the problem that we usually face is on an individual scale that the cost and benefit analysis doesn't just match up. The cost is for an earthquake resistant building is too high and the benefits are uncertain because we don't even know that if disaster is going to strike or not. How do you think that we can go ahead and wake people up from its slumber without the disaster itself? Uh, that goes beyond just awareness, that we need more incentives and stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can solve this? Yes. Now, as I said, um, till a disaster happened, most of us assume that doesn't happen to us. And this, that way the cost-benefit analysis is very, very skewed. Um, you know, I'll take the example of this health insurance, for example. Most people don't have health insurance because they assume that, look, you know, what can happen to me? I would, I would you know small fever or something, I go to hospital and the cost of this is this much. And they don't assume that they could have a major problem and which could totally ruin their finances. This most people don't assume. <coughs> Whereas in the individual cases that may even be true that you may or may not have a specific um, illness or uh, accident, but at an institutional level, as I said, flooding and other things, it's, it's very predictable that you know, if you, you could have this thing. You may not think it will happen to you. As I said, many people who lived in Kerala in places which were flooded once, they still assume that it will not happen. And you know, as, even as water were coming into their villages, they said, no, no, it will not come to my house. You know? And people refuse to, to move from their house, but they do. So, so it's a education process. It's not just to say blanket that, look, you know, it could happen to you. It's specifically knowing about this. And what in many other countries do is that they have granular information that can, you can do it for your house. You know, if you put your house on a Google Earth map and then, then actually tell you, the municipality actually tell you that your house has this, this, and this problem. And in many places, actually, the cost of your house actually depend upon these things. That if you have a house which is in a flood prone area or an earthquake area, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the cost of house go down. So if you have that type of granular information, then people would do. That's one thing. And the second thing is that it's not only about building new. They can also have a lot of um, retrofitting. And it's also about you could make your houses safer rather than safe. So it's a you know, calibrated thing. So you have 100 thousand rupee, you can do something. You have 100,000 rupee, you can do a little bit more and make it more safer. So it's a series of things you do. And you, know, you also do very calibrated things, such as, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, if you, um, I, I'll tell you something which I did myself. Okay, I had a, you know, like all of us, we had a safe deposit locker. I had a safe deposit locker with a bank. Okay, my house is in a place which is safer. And I was in a plane coming from Geneva, and then I suddenly remembered, by the way, the, the bank where I had this deposit locker is next to the river, which I never thought. I, and I was like, very, my God, you know, did all this, my record go underwater. And, um, and I was, because I was so involved in the management of it, I did not want to ask that question. Um, because if I found out, I'll actually be a bit, you know, uncomfortable dealing with the bigger disasters. I, so one week I did not ask that question. But then, I, uh, my friend, in the conversation, told me that you know when the flood actually happened, a boat came to the doorstep of that bank, and that's where people were rescued and moved in and out. So I said, okay, I'm safe. <laughs> because, but it was so close. You know, one feet more or two feet more it would have been inside the locker. So what I'm saying is that then you would think, okay, your document has to be in a safer place. So you could also calibrate that type of risk as well in terms of minimizing the risk. Good evening. I'm George Kaliwail from Deepika newspaper. Yeah, my question is almost related. When most of, when, whenever whatever uh, disaster happens, our health system, especially the hospitals, including the major hospitals, 
are not really equipped other than they have a trauma care unit somewhere in the major hospitals they may have an emergency unit but actually they don't have a disaster system there manage, disaster management system in most of the hospitals even in the aims the biggest in india most of the state governments or the national medical mission i never saw any such uh, real disaster management plans in the hospitals what is your suggestions for that for the governments and the for the public my understanding is that the national institute of disaster management actually have prepared a guidance on uh, hospital emergency management i agree with you that, that it's an absolutely important i mentioned the critical infrastructure protection is doubly important if the hospitals are not prepared then how is you know how will you save the people who are going to be affected so it is absolutely important my understanding that the national institute of disaster management actually has prepared such a thing and i can, if you share the card i will find out and let you know even if not there i'll let you know other good practice whether all the hospitals have gone through it this i can't uh, say but this time and also in chennai i know number of cases where they did not uh, work very well that yes hospital protection was indeed a problem but we also have good cases where hospital did work to a certain type of protocol and they you know they had a graded thing that yes first you save the most vulnerable and critical people you know, maybe you move them maybe people who are can go home and be better managed they are discharged then you always save the documents and, and so they they had a protocol and they they made use of it so there are structural and non structural elements um, so clearly this is something which should be done in every uh, you know not only in hospital but also you know let's say for police station for example um many things which were considered critical infrastructure should be their schools um because schools are often doubling as um you know relief centers so if the schools collapse then the opportunity to have the relief centers collapse so but definitely hospitals uh, is a must number one i would say in 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 this type of situation i'll try to see i think I, you know i have seen it uh, i'll get share the documents hello sir good evening sir i am from ian express my question is related to kerala flood so actually rain was the first reason for the flood at is at its reach up to 2086 mm in very short time but sir there was one more reason what i personally feel what do you feel about that dams there were around 44 dams and the level of water reached very high then after two weeks it was leave the rain the dam was open after that so sir that is also the reason and the deforestation are also the reason as that can absorb the water so deforestation and the dams management authority authorities rule makes very important at that time we cannot do anything with that but so the disaster could be less hmm. you know this question was asked multiple times in the press um, even at political level uh, multiple times um i have i was also asked this multiple times and i have looked at it actually we have 60 dams um, dams and um we have 44 rivers uh, in the state all of them got flooded all of them sort of crossed their banks and many of these rivers did not have any dams they also has the flood flood so this flooding would have happened with or without the dams so that's number one number 2 is that many of the dams are actually smaller dams that in the three days where we had really intense rain many times the volume of the dam the reservoir fell on that so that, there even if you had done something before it did not have delayed it by another day but the flooding would have still happened but when you have really big dams then that possibility exists when you have the really big dams where you could have a substantial buffer then that type of thing ha happen and this is one of the recommendation which now will come into force as to how do you manage your dams which also has a potential as a as a tool to reduce the disaster this is something which uh, will come into force the other question was about um, deforestation and the holding capacity this is true in most time but this time was such an unusual time that this would not have made a big difference this time but i agree that in principle 
anything which delays this thing, anything which absorbs and you know allow more water to sink in, etc., would, would help. But this time, it has been raining since April, so the most of the soil was already saturated, and the amount of rain which fell in three days was so tremendous that many of these things didn't have a, uh, that much of a significance. But the basic philosophy is right. The Yes, I, I will just come to that. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, hello, yeah. sir. My name is Bhavya and I'm from Iyan Express. So actually, uh, I remembered when I was in school in seventh grade, uh, we had a drill hmm. related to uh, disaster management uh, during hmm. earthqu okay. earthquake specifically. Okay. And we were told that uh, we should sit under the table and after a certain time limit, we had to evacuate the building. But um, a, few, a year or two later, uh, a picture came out. Uh, an earthquake had uh, occurred uh, in some place of the world and a child was sitting next to a table and uh, the table, uh, table was totally crashed and the child was safe. And so we were being taught wrong that you should actually sit under the table while actually you had to sit right next to the mm. table. So I, I was actually thinking what if uh, between that time limit a disaster occurred here, uh, so uh, we would have done the wrong thing. Mm. And also, uh, one mm. more thing sir, uh, in our uh, environmental studies book, uh, the disaster management lesson was just one page long, while other lessons were five to seven pages long. So, sir, do you think that, uh, like you portrayed, that there's a really wide scope in this topic. So do you think that in the education sector, this topic should be widened a little bit more so that the youth can learn and save people's lives? Yes. Number one, uh, the second question, absolutely. You know, yeah. the, I think disaster management should be a um, lot bigger uh, topic. And as I said, so as much as we do history of wars, you should also teach you history of disasters and you know, what has happened in a place, etc., etc., so that you remember the cities have a history of uh, certain type of disaster, without doubt. And I'm very glad that the civil service exam, now disaster management is a topic, so at least half a million people per year would read it, even, even if only to score some marks. The other question about the, 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 ch the table thing, I, you know, I, I have seen that video as well. I think the, the recommendation to sit under the table is still robust. You know, one particular you know, example showing doesn't make a difference. But th there is a fundamental shift, though, which uh, I often um, refer to in, uh, when I lecture in other countries. The whole recommendation of sit under the table came at a period when tables were built of hardwood, you know, properly. You know, in our childhood, you know, these were teak tables. So you sit under that, then of course they were very safe, okay? It would stand the weight of what came over it. But now we are talking about plywood tables. So you sit under it, probably it's not a very bright idea. So would, it's a little bit of calibrated message that, okay, you verify it's a plywood table, don't sit under it. So, but you have to do that type of calibrated message uh, in, in that uh, type of uh, situation as to, where you should do. But I agree that you have to learn this, uh, uh, to teach the up-to-date lessons. Uh, but sitting by the side is actually not a particularly good lesson. That's just one example where it so happened. You know, there could be, to give a trivial example, there could be a situation where a car, let's say, flipped over into a, um, into a river, and a person died because he could not unbuckle the seat belt in time. So you could say that, look, if there's no seat belt, you would have been safe. Probably it is. Yeah, but statistically, only you can give an advice. Statistically, more lives will be saved if everybody uses a seat belt. There may be one situation where one person's life was lost because of this. So that doesn't negate the thing. Come back to your question before I <laughs> got to you, sir. Um, in many situations, as you, including in Delhi, um, when you build in low-lying areas, um, it does cause floods um, in the um, in many places. But this time, you know, these were all, let's say, override by the, the scale of the flood. So regardless of whether you built in the wetland or not, they were all flooded. But yes, it's not a good idea to build in a wetland or paddy field or block the, road, block the wetland by building a road across. Thank you. We'll a question. Good evening, sir. So my, myself, Musaddiq from Iyan Express. The question is uh, that, in Delhi, 
So uh, we see pollution as a bigger disaster other than uh, floods and the obviously the earthquakes because pollution is something that we face that as a disaster we face daily. Mm -hmm. And even during winters, uh, uh, due to pollution, the visibility gets very low and we obviously can't, we obviously have a very less number of aircrafts landing at the airport. So, leaving the aircraft thing aside, sir, uh, the pollution which is caused, which is mainly caused by the gases uh, uh, emitted by the factories and industrial areas and the uh, vacuolar smoke, they lead to a, a, a lot of chronic dis diseases. So, making the pollution a bigger disaster in Delhi. So, sir, what steps? The question is, what steps do we take to stop this chronic disaster, uh, like taking the lives of people in Delhi? Mm. Now, to be honest, I'm actually not prepared uh, to answer that question. Not, you know, not because I know it and I am not prepared. It's because I have not studied that issue. But I know this is indeed a, uh, a big issue, and it's a big issue in many countries. The urban air pollution. Um, I, I was told in many countries it actually kills a lot more people than may, you know, many other causes. It could be number one or number two killer in many, many places and it's something which is to be addressed. But we have to look at what are the, uh, the root causes, where it is coming from, you know, not necessarily only from here, it could also be coming from uh, outside. What are the climatic conditions which precipitate this and what is that one could do in a graded manner to avoid these things. I have in my earliest um, part of my career, between 95 and 99, I used to live in Brunei and where we had forest fire in Indonesia coming in as huge air pollution into the town and blanketing the whole place. And there the problem was, you know, you know slash and burn agriculture in another country which is coming across. and. Um, so we have to do, again, do a greater response. The first one is to save yourself by, you know, having your mask, that type of work. Second one is to see what all activities you can restrict and control that you don't drive at this place, you close the school and so on and so forth, and then you deal with the root causes. So that, that's a theoretical f framework. But the practical one, in Delhi, I'm not really up to date on it. So. Yes. So, Hello, sir. Yeah. Okay, yes, please. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I am Surbi from Ian Express. Sir, as you said that we are dealing with uh, disasters in a better with the, with the passage of time. But then, sir, when we look at the graph, we see that there is an increment in uh, the mishaps happening. So, sir, you said that infrastructure and technology is something to be blamed. But then, sir, why don't we take uh, it as a weapon instead? Like, if it is something to be blamed, why can't we use it as a weapon? against disasters. Mm. I'm not sure if I actually said infrastructure and technology is the... So, uh, like I, the construction yeah. of buildings that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, I mentioned, yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe I wasn't very clear. I, I mentioned that more and more people are actually living in more and more vulnerable areas. So it's not the, the fact that they build, but they're building in places. For example, when someone come to Delhi, for example, someone who is not rich, so the areas where they can afford is often place where other people don't want to stay, and that's, if you link it all, the then, areas. yeah, the, the area could be because it's flood prone. So therefore people don't want. And therefore if you then end up building, so that's the type of problem which you, uh, which you happen. But yes, technology is one of the biggest way in which you leverage and reduce um, death, both by long-term planning, by, you know, constructing better. For example, after the Kerala flooding, people are thinking, should we construct house on stilts, you know, houses which stand on stilts, because in many parts of the world, Southeast Asia, and I was told even in Northeast India, they actually have houses on stilts, so that one meter, two meter flood will come and go, and nothing will happen to people inside the house. So, so you can use technology. Social media, tremendous, you know, power multiplier in terms of uh, reducing disaster risk. The way information is going, I was told when I went to a seminar, um, in Europe that just by tracking Twitter feeds um, by big data analysis, you can predict floods faster than you will predict flood by looking at the flood itself. Because people, you know, are the flood proceed, floods, uh, the flood on Twitter precedes the flood <laughs> in the ground. So yes, so, so that type of uh, technology leveraging is possible. Hello, good evening, sir. Yeah. This is Pragya from Ian Express. Mm -hmm. And actually, I saw a video 
that that is almost uh, six years old, in which you said all disasters are preventable, and you just defined disaster as something which is not in our control. So my question is, if it is not in our control, how it is preventable? Mm -hmm. And I am very uh, happy and thankful that you saw my TED talk. <laughs> yeah, it's TED talk. I think I think this is how you know young people should come to meetings. They do a you know research on the people who are going to speak. Okay. I actually did not say things which are not in our control. I said a disaster is something which is above the means of the society around it to deal with. So that's what it is, a disaster is. For example, in, in Kerala, I, I typically give this example. If a man stands under a coconut tree, and if a coconut falls on his head, for him, it's a big disaster. But not for the village, because the delay, village can deal with the fact that a man is no more, okay? But not for him or his family. So this is how the disaster is calibrated. It's the same for everything. A village probably would consider a disaster if a bus plunged into the river. But for the state, the state can deal with it because it's, um, it's, it has a lot more resources. So at every scale, uh, there's some place people can deal with and you, you cannot deal with. And I, when I say all disasters are preventable, uh, that means that if you look at it fundamentally, then it can all be prevented. So, Let's say 2,000 people die on the roads in Delhi every year. Each of the 2,000 have a reason, and none may be identical. But if you look at them very closely, then you would find that it's almost always one small mistake which if that, that person has spotted, would have eliminated. For example, if you had a you know, child sitting in the front seat, no seat belt, no child seat, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the way, if you think through and plan, then you can reduce all disasters. Yeah. Uh, sir, my name is Jayashree. I'm from Delhi Post. So my question is, uh, are we just swinging from uh, disaster to disaster and uh, not really uh, talking about a long-term plan to deal with? And uh, from that also, uh, uh, my perception is why there is a lack of interest because disaster is considered as a negative term, as a, uh, a negative uh, feeling, negative. Um, there's a neg all, all the negativeness uh, is there uh, regarding uh, regarding a disaster or any uh, disaster for that matter. So obviously people are scared to. Okay, probably they might just uh, uh, see floods happening, earthquakes happening, or they might experience one, but then they don't want to talk about it. So. Is it like, and also the uh, uh, swinging mentality from one to another mm. is also coming from mm. that, probably? Mm. Uh, uh, but the first part, um, you know, we are not swinging from one to one. We are actually learning. But uh, if you look at the India as a country as a lot, this is true that, you know, you might see disaster in Uttarakhand, disaster in Chennai, disaster in Kerala. That way there's a swing. But what I meant is that in Chennai itself, they are improving. They are learned from those lessons and they change. Kerala, we learn. Now, I think it's Chanakya who said that you can learn all this, you know, you can correct yourself from your own mistake, but then you may not live long enough. It, uh, so you should correct from other people's mistake. Um, so this probably we are not very good at, that looking at another state and, uh, and, and changing it. Um, that's um, something which I think we should do increasingly. I, I forgot the second part of your question. Yeah, the negative, uh, you know, this is a little bit of philosophical uh, thing and psychological thing as well. Uh, it is true, and if there's a psychology theory, you can probably confirm it, that society is bound to forget these things. And that's probably one of the coping mechanism by which societies forget about big disastrous event, particularly because they think they are not in control, you know. What, uh, a disaster, a natural disaster, what could you have done? Um, and there is nobody to blame and you know no one to be worried about and therefore they uh, do. so this this is true um, that um, that may be a coping mechanism of the society to deal with it and uh, yesterday i was talking in another lecture and i was saying that in china when they were rebuilding a city they said if you were to rebuild this city only for those people who went through a disaster then almost every house there would only have the memory of a disaster in that city. So instead, they actually decided to build the city for twice as many people, and half the people came from areas which are not impacted by disaster. 
so that the overall city, half the people came to a new city with a lot of you know, new ideas. And the other half, of course, was very negative. But it then the net effect was that it became a positive city. So there are that type of philosophical thinking going on in disaster recovery as well. May I ask the last question, yes. uh, Murali? <clears throat> when do you think a disaster is due in Delhi? <laughs> Next, um, so that we can prepare. You know, I remember reading the newspapers that uh, when huge winds happen, buildings tend to sway and mm. not collapse. Mm -hmm. In New York, somebody mm. living on the mm. 80th floor of some building, he said, I read in mm. the papers a few days ago. And in Japan also, you know, to, to cope with the uh, situation, mm. the buildings don't collapse, but they can sway. Mm -hmm. Now, is that kind of technology being used in our country? And whenever a tall building is built, do you think India needs to make a law insisting that you should build it in such a fashion, particularly in quake-prone or disaster-prone areas, that they must have a mechanism by which a building simply won't collapse, but it can cope with, uh, you know, uh, furious winds and so on? The, um, the earthquake saying is, I think, you know, it's... Um, Many buildings are designed like that. And my, my own understanding is that our own building codes are actually robust and calibrated to those things. Um, we, you know, we don't luckily have many experience of an earthquake in Japan. You know, many things happen. So you actually see these video pictures uh, coming in. Um, but we don't have many, many of those experiences um, here. But I think the, bi the big buildings are indeed, at least the standards are the same, and many of them are often designed, you know, by inter sharing international experiences. Um, I think our bigger challenge is probably the incremental construction which happens. You have built something, and then you are just adding something to it, and there, at that point, or making modification in a, in a building which is designed properly by, you know, partitioning it and so on and so forth. That, that's a problem. In many countries, the old housing stock get renovated by you know, demolishing it and put, you know, making it new, which doesn't happen as much in India as, uh, as in other countries. Um, in, some, in many countries, they have you know, housing inspectors going to the houses and saying, okay, this house is, you know, can leave, cannot leave, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, in Delhi and Mumbai, as you know, every year there's a case of house collapse which happens. So uh, the other question, when is a disaster happening? I think it's, I would leave it to the young people to do. To, to, uh, yes. Yeah. So, is the bottom line that the new buildings are safe in Delhi? You know, this. The building codes are as far as with the international standards? You know, as a civil engineer, this is my understanding. I must say that I have not practiced civil engineering in India recently, so I cannot make a very definite statement. But my understanding at that time when I was practicing was that our building codes were robust enough for the type of risk which we are having and they were being built. Whether you know, it's always being built to that is not something which I can say with <laughs> that certainty. I have just one more thing which I wanted to say. I have um, only one son, uh, Siddharth. Uh, he is autistic and um, he is also a painter. So he is doing a painting exhibition in Delhi in November 2nd and 3rd. So I have a few of the flyers here. So I um, will give one to you and I... I wish uh, you all came and, you know, engraced him. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Before I um, uh, invite Mr. Bassan to propose a vote of thanks, I want to give this specially designed memento to Murli for taking the trouble of coming and uh, you know, talking to us. Uh, highly informative, uh, especially for us. And uh, you had actually come from Kerala just after the Kerala floods. Uh, we have also read a lot about you, I mean, about your interviews that you had given in Kerala. I mean, as far as we are concerned, we are all living in Delhi. I mean, what you had just said is, uh, what do you call, uh, <laughs> dangerous for ourselves. 
So I like to thank Mr. Murli for coming here and spending around one and a half hours with us on behalf of uh, Foreign Correspondents Club and also the Kerala Press Club. I sincerely thank him for this. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming here on our invitation and uh, being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you again. Um, and uh, we'll be delighted to do more events with the Kerala uh, Press Club uh, yeah. in future, okay? Thank you. Please join us for a cup of tea and some hot pakodas. Hopefully there. <laughs>